Clark? Okay, so I guess we can go ahead and get started. I think we have some more people flowing in. So again, is everyone having a good time? Some good talks? I know I went to a number of them yesterday, they were outstanding. Uh, this is probably one of the better conferences that I do go to. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Get to meet a lot of new people, make some new friends. I always love doing that. So that's a lot of, a lot of fun. So uh, today's presentation, uh, Fail Now So We Don't Fail Later. You know, I was so tempted to kind of rename this to uh, Fail Now So We Don't Flail Later. And uh, so uh, I didn't do that. Uh, kind of wish I had. So let me go ahead and get started here. So who am I? Uh, my name is Daryl Hyland. I currently work for Rapid7 as a research lead. Uh, just took on this new role, uh, doing research in IoT technology is what my new role is. I've been Rapid7 for about three years. I've been in IT for over 25 years, worked for various Fortune 500 companies, some media companies, doing uh, almost every role you can imagine with an IT. And one of my favorite roles has been security. So I've been doing security for about approximately about 15 years, and I've been working as a consultant for the last eight years. My role has been to go into uh, corporations, government agencies, and such, do pen testing, consulting, advising on various security topics. I love doing a lot of research. Uh, I expect a number of you have probably seen some of my presentations in the past that can get very technical. Today's presentation is not going to get into a lot of technical stuff, but hopefully I'm going to have some stories that will help uh, show a point that I'm trying to uh, bring to the table so that we can improve our overall security. That's the ultimate goal here. So how many people we have here are na uh, military, ex-military, served in the military? So great, great. Thanks a lot for your service. So I have a little story here. So I used to serve on board a fleet ballistic missile submarine during the uh, Reagan administration, during the final height of the Cold War period. And one of the things we used to do, and, and everyone that's been in the military understands this, we train, and we train, and we train again. The kind of training we do on board a ballistic submarine would probably make your uh, hair stand on ends. We would actually train literally the annihilation of the human race every day. What was the purpose of that? Obviously the purpose was to create a deterrent so that our enemies would fear us, so that they would not nuke us, knowing that we would turn around and wipe them out. One of the other things that is critical is the day-to-day -day survival of a submarine. Obviously submerged underneath the ocean is not a comfortable or safe environment. We've lost a number of submarines over the years. The Thresher in 63, uh, the Scorpion in 68, from various failures on board. So one of the things that used to fail on board a submarine that we used to train for was, was known as a jam dive. So on the stern, the stern of the plane, there's the uh, ship, there's the stern planes. These help the submarine to go up and help it to dive, typically how it's worked. The problem is, is if you have a hydraulic system failure, those stern planes collapse. The submarine goes into an instant dive. So when we were at what we refer to as uh, test depth, which is the safest operational depth of the submarine, which I trust you was quite deep, if you had, and you were running head flank, you were doing a transit, let's say, across the Atlantic Ocean, and you had a hydraulic system failure, those stern planes would collapse. If you did not take a type of evasive maneuvers and actions, survival rate of the submarine was 10 to 15 seconds. The entire submarine would implode, killing everyone on board. So we would literally train. Probably every week or two, the captain would come up and order a jam drive drill. Someone would take the stern planes, put them into full dive, and everyone had to do their various operations to keep that submarine from going too deep. Now, obviously, when we trained, we weren't training at test depth because uh, failure there was a, a real failure. So we would, we would test at a safer depth so that we could learn from it. 
And we, if we failed, we'd retrain. If we failed, we'd retrain. Things we used to do was we would reverse the, the, the blades on the submarine, try to back it down. We'd blow the forward ballast tanks. And then what we would do is we'd take the, one of the first things they used to do was take the rudder and put it in a full turn. The idea with that is, is on a submarine, it flies like an airplane underwater. So what it would do is, if the submarine was in a crash dive at a high rate of speed and you took the rudder and threw it to one direction, the submarine would turn, and in that turn would do what's known as a snap roll, and the whole submarine would roll on its side and go up versus down. So we would do this to prevent, obviously, the implosion of the submarine and killing everyone on board. Now, of course, in the security world, if you fail in the real world, you're probably not all going to die. That's a, that's a good thing. But still, if you do fail, it can have serious consequences on your organization. And what we're going to do is we're going we're to talk about a, a specific problem that's been building out there and not necessarily getting better. And we're talking about failing and how maybe through some other ideas or concepts or us rethinking the whole problem, we can possibly improve uh, that what's going on. So today's agenda is I want to discuss and identify this problem. So we have three key areas. We want to discuss our current approach to that problem. How are we approaching that? And I'll have various stories about, as a consultant, I've been into a lot of companies and a lot of organizations, and I've helped them test a lot of these things. So I can share some of that fail with you and some of the successes that I've seen so that we can actually learn from some of those successes and then talk about some of the training aspects or partnership aspects that we can do with our consultants or with you know, a pen testing company or whatever you're working with to actually improve your overall organization. Like I said, discuss uh, some solutions for mitigating that. And again, it's very important. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm only here to give you some food for thought. I mean, every industry is different, so you got to figure out what model works for you and what makes sense. Again, this is not too large of a crowd. This is actually a, an outstanding size crowd because I want you to engage with me. Let's not turn this into Daryl just talking for an hour even though I probably have no problem doing that. <laughs> Let's go ahead and engage me during this. So if you have questions, you have comments, you have input, please share those with us, and we can share them with everyone, and we can turn this into a full learning opportunity for everybody. So data breaches. Oh, my gosh. So how many people here have lost their data in data breaches? Is that all? Do you guys actually have any data, the rest of you? I've lost my data so many times that uh, I've lost count of it. I usually lose, I usually have somebody steal my data from some third party source uh, about every year. I lost, I lost Target. I lost data at Home Depot. I lost data when at the IRS. I lost data with uh, the Navy. I lost data with the state of South Carolina. So it seems like if, if you see me engaging some organization with my data, go the other way, because they're going to lose it. Uh, I've got to the point where I promised everyone on Twitter I'm just going to start posting my social security number and credit card every six months and just save them all the problem, the, the hassle. So data breaches. So here's a small sample, a small sample of the number of data breaches that have occurred. Uh, the Ashley Madison. So how many people here were caught in the Ashley Madison one? <laughs> How many people are not being honest because your boss is sitting beside you? <laughs> How many bosses are not being honest because they're, they're, <laughs> they're workers there? <laughs> okay. I'd hope I trapped some of you there, but it wasn't that lucky. Okay. So we get into these, and, and there's a couple things we need to make note of these. And, and we don't even need to delve into these. There's one, there's just two key points here that we need to discuss. One is these data breaches are taking a long time to, to solve. To disclose. Look at these numbers. Some of them we didn't get any information. You know, uh, they didn't want to tell us for whatever reason. But I expect it was a period of time. Uh, here we have uh, Premier, eight, eight and three quarter months. Anthem, nine months. Office of Personal Management, 11.5 months. So it's been averaging out like 200 days, I think, uh, overall, that's taken for them to detect these breaches. Now the truth is, is 
I'm not overly shocked or even concerned if an organization's breached. It's going to happen, you know. If you have data that the attackers or hackers or illegal entities out there want, they're going to try to get it, and they're going to gain access to your networks, unless you completely shut your networks down and have no functional access in or out. And, of course, then you're going to impede your, your ability to do your job in a lot of cases or your workers to be able to do their job and get things done. And we get into this, so we're going to have to figure out how to solve this. So, again, data breaches are taking a long time to detect, way too long. Second, we know they're going after PII data, credit card data, social security numbers, critical data that they can actually sell online. Heck, they're even selling, you know, contact information like phone numbers and, uh, you know, phone numbers and emails and stuff like that. The uh, Verizon one that just happened, Verizon Enterprise. From what I understand, that breach only got contact information, but yet I think it was for sale uh, on one of those uh, dark web, dark things for like a hundred grand, so... So they're selling all this type of data. So, so we can make this statement. This is a solid statement that we can make. Wouldn't you agree? Something's not working. Why is this taking so long? So any questions? Any input? Anyone have any idea why this is taking so long? Has anyone ever been breached here? The organization been breached? Obviously, if it's public knowledge, you can, you can let it go. If, if it hasn't public knowledge yet, don't raise your hand. <laughs> okay, so 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 are these breaches where they found out quickly? You know, I, I mean, I can't. I'm not going to ask you to stand up and say, "Yeah, it took us a year to do this." But uh, you know, this is the case of what's going on. We're being breached. It's taking a long time. We need to solve that problem. So to me, that's the problem. I'm not here to help you solve breaches. Ain't ever going to happen. I'm here to help you solve the problem of taking so long, or at least start thinking about that. So the second phase we're getting into here is in reference to uh, your existing network infrastructure and your security and how you're doing things. It's kind of a layered approach. And one of the first layers is prevention. So everyone here has a prevention program, right? Okay. I, I guess you don't have to raise your hand. Everyone that doesn't raise their hand. <laughs> I could probably just sell your name online and make money with that straight up. So. So prevention, so a good, a good solution for prevention is, is some real simple things, you know, that just to think about. Understanding your environment. So how many people here, you know, think you really understand your environment? Most organi organizations do. It's quite common. They really, truly understand their environment. At least they think they do. Often when I go in and do assessments and pen tests, I find out otherwise. Strange things happen when evil people set foot on their premises. Uh, understanding where their risk lies, uh, where, where it's all light, laid out within their organization. And one of the things that, uh, that I did one time uh, was an organization well, implementing some best practices. Let's cover that first. So you implement best practices. What would we consider best practices? There's, there's like three that I think are important. You at least need to consider, you know, network segmentation. So you get a good network segmentation, good solid password policies. Uh, password policies are big. Uh, and having good ones. Uh, turning on uh, Windows um, complex password is not a password policy because your employees are going to go out and you, you, you know what password they're going to pick, don't you? you? You've had to hear me say this before if anyone's heard me talk. So what is, what is the current password that your employees are using right now? There you go, spring 2016 or spring 16 based on whether they want to the complex or non-complex version of it, you know. You go to the high security one, it's spring 2016. Just the basic security one, it's spring 16. And, and reason, the, why is that happening? Well, to start with, you set complexities, which requires three out of five possible things, you know, uppercase, lowercase, number, special character, um, those type of things. So what do they do? They're going to pick, you know, uppercase, lowercase, and a number. Those are the easiest thing. Most of your employees are going to do that no matter what. And then what do you do? You set a password rotation of every 90 days, right? So what changes every 90 days? Huh, the seasons of the year. So instantly, employees pick that. And it's real easy for an attacker to not even think about putting much effort into it. He just needs to identify your employees' usernames, which is often your email addresses, which are based off their name, which you can get off LinkedIn, you can get off Google, or 
Uh, you can get off the U.S. Census Bureau, which uh, if you haven't seen that done, I'm getting ready to post a blog here soon on how uh, hackers can actually use U.S. Census Bureau data to improve their probability of success for carrying out attacks against your organizations. So, so you get into two-factor also. We want to do two-factor authentication. That's always, I think that's very important. If you're exposing stuff to the Internet without two-factor authentication, you're going to have issues. And when I say two-factor authentication, uh, I was in a conference not too long ago, and the company was talking about how they were implementing two-factor, a, a version of two-factor authentication, phone factor. Uh, you know, so so that you get a a, a text or a M MMS message type thing, and you can go and enter your code pin number in there, and go yeah, approve and all that type of stuff. I think we're all kind of f maybe familiar with that. But there's a there's a lesser secure version of that, where you basically you get it a uh, MMS message, and you just say yes or reply to it. You don't have to enter any pin number. The problem with that, it's really convenient for your workers, but I guarantee you within six months of entering that going yes, 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 three or four times a day, as soon as a hacker hits the site and they get prompted, they're going to go yes every time. Uh, so when I'm hacking a company and they have that, I instantly go, whoo, this is going to be easy. Because sure enough, their employees always go yes uh, without going, hey, I didn't wasn't trying to log into that system. But they still approve it. Uh, also, uh, two-factor, like I said, and, and I'm saying some of this stuff so you have an understanding that it's not a cure-all. I'm trying to make a point here. Prevention is never going to be 100%. One of the assessments I did uh, a number of years ago was against a law firm, and they wanted me to do a social engineering attack, an electronic phishing-style attack. So what I did was uh, I went to their website, and I go through that, and you're usually trying to take screenshots of that data and build a website that kind of looks like that. That's one of the approaches. So I decided to do something a little different. I decided I would go ahead and do a survey. You know, everyone likes filling out surveys, right? Don't all your employees like surveys? I found out from a phishing attack, if I want to get into a company, let's have a survey. Uh, and, and I always got kind of creative with the surveys. My goal was to, to actually gather data to break into companies, but often I would actually put a real survey out there, which was kind of fun. And then I'd start off asking simple questions, and I would progressively get to the point where I would have employees ratting out other employees. It was just totally funny, you know. So under security policies, who do you know violates those policies? And they start putting in names. If you put that in the beginning, they won't do it. But if you progressively get evil and evil in the questions, inevitably, they'll, almost all of them will start answering, start right, ratting out coworkers, managers. Now, I never did give that information to the customer. <laughs> that would have just been wrong in too many different ways. Uh, but I always found it kind of funny. Well, in this case here, well, they had two-factor authentication, so I'm sitting there going, okay, they want me to break in, do phishing attacks, and break into the organization. They didn't want me to run code on the end user's box, so it wasn't like I could get malware and have them call back. I had to actually farm credentials. So I set up a survey site. Uh, I also uh, set up uh, an email server or email server and all that type of stuff so I can communicate with them, and I threw the survey out there. And the survey actually had a duplicate-looking two-factor validation so they could log in. And I sat there, and as they pinned in their two-factor code off their RSA tokens, I turned around and pinned in the two-factor code into their real-life system. And I was able to break in using a, probably about a half dozen or dozen different accounts. And, and in one case, I had employees send an email complaining that it wasn't I was they were having problems because... You know, it didn't always work. So I'm like, oh, this is cool. So I called him up on the phone, you know, and I kind of talked to him. I'm like, ah, go enter it again. And I'm sitting there watching it come across. I'm like, and I, I've already broken in with their account, but for some reason they had their user or their password wrong. They had their code right, but they had their password wrong. So I basically walked them through it and go, hey, maybe your password's changed. And they're like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, give it to me and let me try it, you know. So then I was able to log in with that. So from there... As an example, you know, this is, this is all about breaches and breaches of data and how long it takes to detect. One, the law firm, which is pretty good size, did not detect anything that I was doing during this whole thing. Uh, 
Ploys never did rat me out, which surprised me. Usually there's at least one ploy goes, this doesn't smell right, and calls somebody. Nobody did that. Once I gained access to the network, I, gained, uh, I used those accounts to gain a foothold to a machine. I moved lateral. I escalated my rights. I broke into all of their critical databases. And this was a law, a law firm that represented very influential people, extremely influential people. That's why they were having this done. I literally broke in and throw and, and gained access to all of the records, financial records, uh, legal documents for these influ influential people. I can't say who they are because it would give away the whole law firm thing. But, but seriously, I gained access to all this and put it all in the report. Shock is, is not the right word to describe what happened there. And this comes into play in a number of these things. You know, understanding your environment. You can still understand your environment. You can implement some best practices. Understanding where your risk lie a lot of times is overlooked. You understand these, these concepts of protecting stuff, but you don't understand what needs protected on your network and how an attacker can gain access. I've seen organizations literally literally go in and go, okay, we're going to take that critical data, that CDE, that financial data, that credit card data environment, and we're going to harden it. It's in this circle. It's hardened. No one can get into it. We're going to protect it. But then I came in in another company, uh, gained access to the company, pulled from Active Directory the list of the users that were DBAs, eventually broke into the DBA's machines, set up key loggers on the DBA machines, gathered all the passwords they used to log into these databases, and since they were allowed into this little realm, I pivoted from their machines and gained access to all the credit card data. Now we understand that this was critical, but we forgot about the fact that the employees were critical too. Those systems that they had access to, they were the weakest point. And we often overlook some of these things. So, so the moral of this story is, is uh, well, prevention doesn't work, but we'll get to that. I got this other thing here. I always like these sayings. I started doing this recently, trying to find some sayings. So here, this supposedly Ben, ben Franklin saying, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Apparently, Ben Franklin never heard of information security. <laughs> because, I mean, think about it. That's not always true. Sometimes the cure is a hell of a lot cheaper <laughs> than prevention. Because you can put everything in place from a prevention standpoint, and you can spend millions of dollars short of taking everyone's computer away from them, give them an Etch-a-Sketch, and requiring them to shake it on their head on the way out the door every day, your data can be compromised, in my opinion. You can be breached. Someone can get a foothold on your network in almost every case. And I've done that across every industry that exists. Now, I've hit some companies that was like, you know, I couldn't get nothing, but neither could their employees, and, and life for them was very difficult. So that's a no-go. And the big thing here I want to point out is the moral of the story. You're never going to be 100% successful with prevention. So that's only one piece of the puzzle. You know, if prevention works 80% of the time, 60%, 80%, whatever, you're doing good. Okay, you know, you go to the next piece of the puzzle, and that's detection. So how many people here have a solid detection mechanism in their environment where they actually look at logs, gather logs, enumerate the log data, and take a look at what's going on in your environment and consider tracking things like uh, behavioral. I don't know how many people get into behavioral things. Obviously, uh, to me, that's kind of critical. You know, if you, have, if you have Joe over here who comes in every morning and logs in at 8 o'clock, He's logged in until 5 o'clock. He connects to three different servers every day and does his job. That's a behavior that can be tracked and measured. So you can figure that stuff out. There's companies and organizations that help you figure that stuff out. And you create these baselines. So what happens is, is if this guy turns around and logs in at 8 o'clock at night, 9 o'clock at night, don't you think there's a, probably a problem? Wouldn't you agree? I would think so. If it's outside the normal behavior of your organization or someone in your organization, there's something going on. E e either Bob is up to no good, which is a possibility, or somebody else has got a hold of his account and is actually using it. Or Bob, instead of logging into those three machines, logs into 30 different machines. It's an indication that something's going on. 
So good solutions require effort. Effort's a big thing. Uh, and and I, I, I joke about this because I do these pen tests. And, uh, and the companies that think they have detection capability, good detection capability, it's kind of funny because I'm in there, I'm doing a pen test, run some scans, I'm breaking into stuff, and all at once all my network connections go down. It's like, and they all come running in the room going, ah, we caught you. Yeah, that's good, good. Yeah, you caught me. But you know what I'm thinking? Dear God, man, you better notice the freight train coming through your living room. Because I'm doing a pen test, I'm not there being quiet. I'm there to discover vulnerabilities and issues. I'm taking what an attacker does in six months, a year, 18 months, and I'm cramming it into five days. So think about that when you're getting assessments done. If you detect that, if you don't detect that, oh dear God, you're in bad shape. And that does happen. I've lost count of the number of assessments that I've asked the customer, did you notice anything? No, no, everything was fine. We didn't hear a single peep out of anybody or anything. I had one customer I did an assessment. One of the things I used to do, if I broke in from the outside and I would gain access to like some critical systems or active directory, I would kind of like, I, I always like to leave a trace there. One of the things we used to do is we would create a domain admin account on the system. And there was two reasons for that. One, to show that we were there, to prove it. Two, was to give them the ability to track what we were doing. Because we'd, we'd elevate, we would get a domain admin count, and then we would use that domain admin count to compromise a lot of other things. So now they have a track record. You know, it isn't like, hey, what did you guys do? You can see what we did. You should have logs that can track everything we did. And then on my way back out the door, I would disable the account so no one can actually use it. So I did this on an engagement. I broke in from the outside. So this company was a mortgage company. Uh, and they had their, um, the way they were set up was they did not use any PII data in none of their databases. That was their claim to fame. We track everyone based on a serial number. So they were a, a mortgage track, they weren't a mortgage company, they were a mortgage analysis company or something weird like that. So that was their claim to fame. So I got on the phone call with this guy to kick the, kick the call off and the guy goes, you know, yeah, what we are, we're a mortgage company, we don't have any PII data. But we're getting ready to form a partnership, and the reason why we need this assessment done is so that we can give this to our customer, or our partner, so he can, he can know that we are secure. And, and I'm thinking there, I, you know, how do I, how do I tell this guy that, that the report I deliver him in two weeks, he probably not gonna wanna give this to anybody. Cause I asked him straight up, have you ever had an assessment done? No, I've never done an assessment. So I said, okay, I said, uh, you may have to make some, do some fixes and stuff like that. He goes, okay, okay. So I did the assessment. I broke in from the outside. I took control of, this is like three day, three day assessment. I took control of all of their infrastructure, network infrastructure, control of all their systems exposed to the internet. I had full access to every client machine on their network. I gained access to every one of their databases. And I also managed to find and steal PII data out of the databases that he claimed did not exist. I put this in the report. And the, 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 the saddest part of this is we had a closeout meeting. The poor guy started crying on the phone. You know, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. He literally started crying. You know, what am I to do? I have to deliver this to my partners in a week. And, and I told him up front that that may not be doable. And, uh, and, and of course, we laid out everything he could do to fix these, to mitigate these problems. And most of it was, uh, was external facing. Some real good, easy fixes. So there's only about a dozen fixes. So, you know, a, a few good tech guys could probably get these all done in a week. So and he never did follow up, so I didn't find out how that played out. Uh, but but it, was, it was really sad. And it's an example of, you know, not understanding your environment. Uh, another thing is uh, matching your business model. Everybody has a different business, a, a different model on how they approach risk and security in your organization. And you have a different model based on the type of data that you actually hold or contain. So for anyone to get up there, you know, for me to get up here and say this is the one solution for everyone is not doable. You have to figure out those solutions for yourself. So detection is very critical. And a lot of times it doesn't happen. Uh, I'd say probably only 50% of the companies I do assessments 
with actually detect the freight train coming through their living room, maybe half of them, and that's pretty much it. And out of those, out of those half that detect the freight train coming through their living room, uh, do not understand how to respond to it. That's probably the biggest, the biggest thing. So once you detect, how do you respond? How do you react to that action that's taking place on your network is critical. And these are, you know, the three core pieces. So when we get into uh, dealing with this, we need to understand, do you have a plan? And I mean, you have to have a serious plan. I mean, really think about this. One of the, one of the pen tests we did, and this one was hilarious, and it kind of makes, it, it kind of puts out there the, how, why there's a big deal with the plan and how you build a plan. We were actually doing a phishing attack on an organization and br using that to break in. This happened to be a police department for a moderate sized city. So what we did was uh, we, we created a phishing attack and used the phishing attack to gain access into the email system, okay? Once we're in the email system, we expand out the phishing attack using real people's emails, okay? Once they figured out a phishing attack was going on, because we were using internal emails to actually send malware to people that would execute and give us shells back. Okay, that was the goal. So uh, their IT department, what do they do? Well, they send out an email saying, don't do this, okay? Don't do, they don't want to do this. So they're using the same email system that we own. So what do we do? We use their exact same count, send an email out saying, hey, that last email is bogus. If you want to stop this, you better install this software now. <laughs> and of course, then there was an email battle. Who the hell is this? <laughs> so they're sending emails to themselves going, who the hell is this? This is really hilarious. So, and the whole battle went back and forth and... Uh, Oh, they were furious. They were absolutely furious, but it pointed out a really big issue. What is your plan if you lose control of your email system, as an example, and the attackers are using your email system? This is your form of communication to your employees, right? And, and I assure you, every time you ask your employees to do really stupid things like click on links, install software, do this, do that, and then the exact same things. Hey, I was caught in a phishing attack in our organization. And they sent out a phishing. It was a pretty good one. And, I, you know, I got caught in it. Uh, it looked pretty legitimate. So anyone can get caught in these phishing attacks. So every time they send me an email to do something now, I refuse. <laughs> Until it gets to the point where they want to threaten me. And, well, now what they do is they send an email. And in the email, there's like a link, you know, that goes to something that says, hey, this is not phishing or something like that. It's kind of funny. I probably shouldn't have said that. Now it's on film and they're going to fire me, but that's life. So, uh, so we have a response plan, or you should have a response plan. And these are the three key pieces. Your, your uh, prevention, your detection, and your response. So if we all have those and we all make some attempt at those, how come we're still having these breach times that are averaging out 200 days? My philosophy is, is, you know, these can always be improved. But one of the key things that make all this stuff important and make these things work are you guys, the people. Not the technology, because you guys make the technology work. So if you're an organization that decides that, you know, we're going to buy technology, but we're not going to bring in the people for the proper care and feeding of it, then yeah, you're, you're, things are not going to work for you. And when the care and feeding of it, that involves training, exercises, practices. So all these things I'm talking about, you need to do yourself. You need to practice these things. Because this is what we want to avoid. Daryl comes in, he's the evil hacker, okay? And of course, we have the internal security, and they are, they are the most ferocious beasts there are. I don't want to see that anymore. I literally don't. This is what I want to see. I want to see somebody that has a passion. Because I think a lot of these things are more successful when your employees have a passion. They understand your environment. You have the right resources, you have the right technologies, and you have people with passion. And so we're going to talk about things that I help that help build all of this, and I think instill a passion in your organization. Training for success. 
So obviously, you guys do training, right? You're here. I'm hoping it's, it's paramount within your organization to do training. So how many people here go to some of the hacker conferences? Wow, is that all? How many people here have been to DEF CON? Black Hat. It's a little more professional. Wow. They don't let you out much, do they? I figured that. Normally, the audiences I speak to, there's at least a certain percentage with Mohawks. Part of those are like blue, green. <laughs> Unlike me and some of my friends, we just don't... <laughs> No mohawk coming. I make up for it in other ways. So, I encourage you to get your staffing training. Training in some of the hardcore stuff, some of the evil stuff, some of the hacking. There's a number of great, SANS has a number of great classes out there on various hacking, web hacking. But it's important that we get them to apply it, and that's where we're failing. Uh, I was at a, uh, I took a training class here about two years ago on uh, web hacking. I'm not sure why I did it, because I was doing that for a living also. Uh, but I thought, hey, you know, it kind of refresher. Maybe I'll pick up, you know, 30, 40% new things that I hadn't experienced before. Unfortunately, that was not the case. It was more like 5%. So 95% of the class was like boring for me. But I made a lot of new friends, which to me is probably one of the other most important things about all these conferences. So a year goes by, and I'm doing a pen test, internal pen test at this organization. Hey, and here are the guys that I was in class with. So I started asking them. I said, well, you know, how, how'd you like the class? They're like, yeah, it was great. I learned a ton of stuff. So I said, you're, you're actually using that stuff around here? And like, no. You just dropped five grand on a class, and you're not using none of it? No, they do not allow us as employees to hack on anything. You are security, right? Yeah. You're not allowed to hack on anything, not even the development environment before it goes into production. I mean, I, you know, I understand the concern with, you know, taking a noob and throwing him at a production environment. <laughs> you know, bad things can happen. Uh, but most of the stuff over time, we integrate new stuff in technologies in. So those are areas for them to actually apply what they learn. So if you're going to spend the money to send your employees to training, I encourage you, you have them use that training. And not, you know, once every six months. If you're spending the money to train somebody on, example, web hacking, then have them use that continuously on your web environment. Because there, you, you, you've gained a skill, you've gra gained brain equity, and you're going to lose it, throwing the money away, if you do not get them involved. Plus, your employees will love it. Oh, gosh. You know, you get them excited about that stuff. It's kind of cool. Uh, force them to do, to, to force your staff to use their training. You know, hey, this is why I sent you to training. I expect you to use it. This is why you're here, your employee. Be part of the process. Try to learn from it. Share your knowledge. The other thing is cross training, which is one of the things I always love to do. So when I worked at Fortune 500 companies, I used to run training classes in the organization where I would come in and I would talk everything from uh, you know nitty-gritty ones and zero network level security all the way up to web hacking or whatever and if I went to a class I would run try to rerun that class when possible for anyone wanted to attend you know what rarely did anyone show up it wasn't expected of them they were a nine to five employee I don't care we need to change that, too. Uh, and there, there's some ways to do that. I think we have something here that may be useful in changing that. Getting your employees to be uh, engaged is critical. You want to create a passion. If you want great security, create a passion in your security people. Create a passion in your IT people. I always had a passion, so I'm, I'm like, I'm not a normal person, so I'm crazy. A uh, normal day for me ends at at typically 6 o'clock for the company, and then I proceed from there to do other training and exercises and learning opportunities for myself to make myself a better employee and advance my career. Uh, an example, typically my Friday night is I get off work at Friday, I get off work at 6 o'clock, I work from home, 
Uh, six o'clock, I eat dinner with the wife, watch TV, I go to sleep. <laughs> I sleep for about an hour around nine o'clock, and then I get up, watch a little more TV with the wife, and then I go to my lab. I spend in my lab every Friday and Saturday night until three in the morning doing research on my own so that I have like cool stuff to bring to these conferences. And this is something I do every week. You're not going to be able to get all your employees thinking that way, but you'd be amazed when you dangle a carrot out there to excite them on something. You can create a passion. And I see that a lot more, obviously, in younger people. You know, those college, guys, college people coming out of college have more of a passion. Take advantage of that. Don't 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 let them become that 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 bored forty year old forty year forty year old white male employee that you know don't don't take offense but that that I've worked that I've worked with for so many years is like uh you know you know they're button pushers give a passion a passion will build a career and it's exciting and what it, what you get out of it is cool training and you get that guy that is so focused on what his job is that he detects, he reacts, he finds these things. I have one company that I do have done work with for over the years. The first day, we're supposed to be stealthy. Stealthy. First year I did it, I was domain admin before his guy caught me. He learned from that. This guy had this amazing passion for detection. So he set it to his, his command control console with 40 screens up, and he could see and detect everything you can imagine. By the third year, I plug my computer into the network, and before I get logged in, he's detected me. Because he's taken the technology, he's built upon it, he's created a passion for being that guy on the network that can make a difference and detect these things to the point where it works. And then what he does is he cross-trains his other people, teaches them what he's doing, get them involved in it also so they can play a part of that. So that's very important. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, cool, cool. Uh, self-assessments. I'm a big fan of this. Doing self-assessments. So train your guys, you know, send them off to classes, and let them do this stuff for you. There's nothing wrong with bringing in a set of another eyes every once in a while, consultants, pen testers to do stuff. But you, what you want to do is you want to make life hard for the pen testers you hire on the outside to do anything. You want to make it so difficult, they can hardly find anything and they have to work for it. I usually engage a customer. I go, I ask them, you know, do you run vulnerability scanners? No. Okay. As part of the contract with Rapid7, we typically give you a 30-day free trial next post. Do me a favor. Use it. It's 30 days until the engagement, 45 days of engagement. I don't want to log onto your network and find half your machines with MS08067 vulnerabilities. That's insane. Why are you hiring me? Run your tools, fix your network, and then the pen testers are forced to look deeper, harder, find those more difficult things, and help improve your security. A pen tester is not going to help you improve your security if I'm finding things from 2003, 2004 vulnerabilities on your network. There's no value in it. You're just wasting money. And this is how you do it. Get your employees doing this. There's so much resources on the internet. Take one of your employees and say, hey, I want you to find out everything you can about wireless security and wireless testing. There's plenty of resources out there. They film these things. Almost every conference has filmed these things. Uh, you know, you can go, go look at Iron Geek stuff, Adrian Crenshaw stuff. Uh, there's probably 30... Uh, you know, 30 films of me doing like similar type stuff, but there's a bunch of them out there, and all these are filmed, and you can use these as training opportunities. Your employees can look at that and go, hey, and they can learn how wireless security works. They can read about it. Give them a time frame to do that. Expect them to cross-train you, tell everyone on the team what they've learned, and then also have them do the work. Have them do an assessment against your wireless network. You know, and if he finds a vulnerability, and you know what? It's a good thing if he finds a vulnerability. You know why? He's going to get excited. Other people are going to get excited, and they're going to go, that is cool. You know, I'd almost be tempted to put a bogus vulnerability out there for him to find. You know, because you're going to form that passion, that excitement. And then what he's going to do from that, now you've got a employee that's excited, he's committed, and he's delivering value to your organization. It's going to help improve your overall security. By doing that, you're also going to increase the downtime 
the time for detection when these passions get in place. I mean, I think it was, wasn't it Target? Uh, they actually noticed the breach, like back when it happened. But for some reason, they were like, oh, we'll just look the other way or whatever the case may be. In, in my opinion, that's driven because there was no passion for what they were doing. They weren't excited. They were bored. You don't want bored security people. Nothing good comes of that. Uh, and this is something I've seen a company do that I thought was absolutely brilliant. They'd started a thing called Hacker Brainstorming. And what they did was each quarter they would go in, and, and I think they had, I, I can't remember how big their IT department was, but they would take three to four people out of, two or three people out of IT. I'm not sure how big your IT, you'd have to gauge it based on the size of your organization. And then they would go for somebody from business, somebody from accounting, somebody from operations, somebody from the front desk, and they would get one person or two people from each department based on the size. And every week for one quarter, they would have to come into a room and they would spend four hours on Friday. And what they would do is they would brainstorm up evil, nasty ways to steal data from the company. That was their job. So they would go in there and, and initially you have to have the security people that can kind of lead this thing and, you know, you know, pull it out of them. But after a few weeks, He's telling me, hey, you know, the, the lady up front that's taking money at the cash register and stuff, she comes up with all these ways to steal money from us. <laughs> you know, and they, or the IT guy comes up with this ways to gain access. You know that this isn't as secure as we think, and someone could do A, B, or C, and then they take all this stuff and they prove, and prove it. Not only do they theorize it, they prove it. They go through and say, do this or have somebody monitor it. Can it be done? Can the HR person have effect over here and farm data out of the people saw system without it being detected? You know, large quantities of pieces of data. And then what they do is they put processes and monitoring in place to better improve these things. And they would do this every month. And what you get out of this is you get an employee that, you know, of course some people are going, teach my employees to rob from me? Are you insane? probably insane, but that's fine. Yes, that's exactly what I'm telling you. Teach them how to do this. They teach you how to do that. What they do is they go back to the, their department every week, and that water fountain conversation starts. Oh, we're learning this, and we're, we're talking about this type of stuff, and everyone gets excited. And next thing you know, everybody wants to be put on that list to be in that class or whatever you want to call it, a brainstorming thing for the next quarter. And you start this process rolling. You improve your security, you improve your employee awareness, you get your employees excited. To me, excitement is the most, the, the most valued thing. If you have an excited employee, you're going to have a successful employee and he's going to make a big difference in your overall security. If you have a sad, pathetic employee that just does his eight hour day job and you know, he gets up every morning and goes, you know what, life sucks, but i got to go to work anyways. You're going to inherit life sucks from him, and it's going to spread within your organization. So I think it's important to actually take it to that next level, exciting your employees and get them involved. So we're running out here. So partnership success. I'm a big fan of partnership. So eventually you're going to reach out to a consultant to do something, whether it's a pen test or whether it's a, you know, a PCI test or whether it's just general consulting. I challenge you to partner with them. Don't, don't hire somebody and come in to do a job and they give you a report two weeks later. Form that partnership. Now we have a partnership with a number of companies and I, I'd like to have a partnership with every company that we work with. One of the companies that we were doing, don't have much time here, go quick. One of the companies we're doing, uh, really good security. Everything I'm talking about, they're kind of doing. They have a really excited department. Their security, the uh, SOC, uh, the Security Operations Center, they're really tough cookies, really good at what they do. They have all the tools, all the technology, and all the people, but did they have all the knowledge? So that was a discussion we had with them. We partnered with them. We decided to do a blue, what's known as a blue red team exercise. So what we did was we took our blue team guys, we took two forensic guys, and we planted them in the SOC told them that they were like auditors from some auditing company, okay? 
And then me and another guy came in from a red team standpoint. Uh, and our goal was to do a red team op operation. And, and I have to admit, you know, um, I didn't have my machine set up perfect. I plugged my machine in, and one of my applications phoned home to a bad place, <laughs> and it red flagged on their system down there. But we kind of, the people down there kind of talked him out of it and said, oh, that was one of my machines, blah, 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 and got us past that. I was like, oh. you know, I got caught the first day. That's pathetic. Uh, but then we continued on. Yeah, really, really uh, low and slow. So we started gaining access to various things. Uh, they weren't necessarily detecting, but remember, a lot of times people aren't going to detect normal transactions in your organization. They're going to start detecting when you start escalating things. Okay? But the way we were going to hide ourselves is we did a little stunt. Now, I told our blue team guys that I was going to do something a little special for everybody. And they were like, what are you going to do? I'm like, I don't think you've ever seen this before, but I think it's a very practical practical approach, and you'll know it when you see it. So when I got on their network, everyone knows I am like have done a lot of printer research and stuff like that. So when I got on the network, the first thing I did was round up all their Xerox printers, and like dozens of them throughout the company, and I picked five of them, strategically planned it throughout the company, and I broke into every one of them and uh, with a, uh, an attack that I designed and got root shells on every one of them. I turned around and set every one of them with SSH services, set up accounts, and we set up all of our attacks to do pivoting through their printers. So if they detected anything we did, it would be to the printers. So we started doing the scanning, started gathering data and stuff like that. And we're on like the third day, and it's, it's going slow, and I'm like, well, let's give them something to play with, okay? So I threw a full-blown brute force attack against Active Directory with like 10,000 names. Okay, so instantly everything in the sock lit up. Poof. We're being attacked. We're being attacked. While that attack was going on, I went over to another printer, pivot through it with a smaller set of accounts, which I thought I had the password for, but I wanted to validate where it had access to. And I used that against Active Directory over here. So they're all over here scrambling, trying to figure out where this attack's coming from. I'm over here with an attack that does work. The other one's just freaking noisy. And our forensic guys are down there, and they say, oh, man, they're going at it. And then all at once, everything stops. And he hears this, oh, shit. It's a printer. What do we do now? <laughs> and everything halted. They had no clue. They had no clue to you how to use their tools to deal with pivoting attacks through the network. And remember, most times an attacker to gain access to critical resources is going to need to pivot. So if you detect it here, coming from this source here, it may not be that source. So literally, I'm capable of going into a network and setting up and pivoting through a dozen printers at one time if I need to, to gain access to something. You're going to be busy running around shutting off printers. The funny thing is they all ran upstairs and stood around the printer. And they were, they were kind of laughing about this. They were like, and they're trying to pull the logs off the printer. And, I, and I'm on the phone with the guy, so I just purged all the logs off the printer. Uh, there wasn't nothing good on there. So it was kind of funny. Uh, and then they had a printer down in the sock, and we used eventually the access. We used the printer in the sock and sent them messages type things. We also, uh, one of the other things is, we also compromised all the machines in the sock eventually. And, and turned on all the mics so we could listen to everything they were talking about in SOC while they were trying to track us down. But the big thing is, is what we did was, at that point of, oh crap, what do we do? We stepped back, we fessed up who we were. Our blue team guys teamed up with them, and the blue team guys we have are absolutely brilliant, and went through a full day or half a day training on how to leverage all of their tools to track us in those type of attacks where they're pivoted attacks. So the goal was, you know, in this, you know, working with the customer like this, we were able to create a model that we could turn into an exercise, a training exercise specifically for them, unique for them, that made a difference. Now their team, if I go in and I do some weird pivot, I expect them to catch me. And I'm hoping to go back later this year. And so we're trying to figure out some other evil things to do. 
I have some ideas, but I'm going to save that for them because they'll probably watch this. I give away all my good things. Uh, and the other thing is individual consultants. Build a relationship. I love a customer who builds a relationship with me. Uh, I wish they would all do it. Uh, unfortunately, some customers, when I hand them a report or I discuss uh, how ugly their baby is, they never want to talk to me again, <laughs> which is sad. But a number of them are excited by it. And I've had a number of customers where I've worked with them for years that follow me across other companies. I have several of those. I had one company that I used to every year do a PCI, a very big retail company, and we would set down. I mean, normally the first few years it was really benign. They would just get a pen test, PCI, PCI pen test. And the year I came, I'm like, I'm like, wait, no, let's talk first. You know, and they're like, oh, wow. So we start talking about their environment and what's important to them and what are they looking for. And then I targeted the stuff I was doing and then we'd stop every day and I would brief out and I would use it as a training opportunity. Uh, and I would show them new things, new ideas. Because since I'm a researcher, you know, I typically share, if I have some cool stuff I'm doing, I shared with my customers before the stuff ever hit the street so they could actually protect themselves. And after that, it got to a point where they wouldn't let anyone else come in. Uh, Daryl's available? No, Daryl's not available. When's he going to be available? And then we would come in and we would do it. And we would do this, this whole process every year. It was fun. You know, as a, pen, a consultant pen tester, I find that exciting when I have a customer who's excited about this stuff. Uh, so we can actually share that stuff. So as we complete here, we kind of talked about real quick over the whole thing. Breaches. We know breaches are taking too long. You're going to get breached, okay? So I'm not so concerned if somebody breaks into your network because that's often quite easy in this day of phishing attacks and stuff like that. Because It's very hard to be 100% secure in those environments here and various things. So you can get breached if you have somebody that is hell-bent on breaching you, okay? They're going to find a way to pull that off. The thing is, we need to be able to detect those. So our detection, our, our, our prevention, our detection, and our response plans, we need to think about those, in my opinion. And we need to grow those. And the way we grow those is the last few things I talked about, uh, is practice, practice, practice. And actually test your environment. Actually do testing. So, so real testing. <laughs> so that your people can see what an attack looks like and they can understand how to respond to it, it's just like we did on the submarine, you know. We practiced that whole jam dive so that we didn't all die in this massive implosion. You know, what a way to go. It's the same way with your organization. Do you want your security to implode because you didn't detect a breach for six months or eight months? No, you don't. So it's the train, train, practice, Change things up. Don't do the same thing over and over. People will get kind of, you know, uh, tunnel vision. Create some of these uh, uh, brainstorming programs. Get people involved. Try to form that a passion. Form relationships with the consultant firms that you're using. Don't just hire somebody to do A, B, or C, take your report and tell them to go away. Create a relationship. That's where the most value is going to come from. And, of course, when you encounter a consultant that has a passion, and is working with you, isn't excited about what he's doing, he wants to help you improve, take advantage of that. Create a partnership with him, too. I often still get phone calls from companies that I've done work for years back, years back. They don't try to uh, consume my time. They know time's money. But they'll often call and go, hey, Daryl, what do you think of this? It's a five, ten minute answer. I love those. I love to hear from past companies I worked for that, I've, that I felt like I've made a difference. Uh, so that's something to think about when you're engaging consultants and, uh, you know, pen testers and stuff like that. Uh, so almost, uh, I guess we are out of time. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, do, do I have the same expectations for banks to be breached, like I said with everyone else? And yeah, I do think it's a, a high probability. I've done assessments probably at maybe a dozen banks, uh, and half of them had some fairly solid security. 
making it very difficult for me to attack them from the outside. Some of them had no exposure to the outside. Only certain employees had emails. You know, it was really restricted. Uh, and they had very good segmentation. So they may have enough security that they detect, prevent these type of things, but my expectations is yes, you're going to get, you, the chances of getting breached are there. If you're a valued target, they're going to try to do it. So your security may be great, but somewhere along the line, if you drop the ball once, they're going to be in the door. So we need to assume that they're going to be in the door and work on the other stuff so we can detect because uh, um, prevention is going to stop, we want to be able to detect them. So if you take all these breaches and you take the detection time frame down, let's say eight months, you take it down to a week, chances are they wouldn't have lost data. And that's what I'm saying. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it.